this is Glenn Lowry. I want you guys to know that The Glenn Show is moving to its own YouTube channel. If you don't want to miss new episodes, then I'd encourage you, please follow the link in the description and subscribe to The Glenn Show at the new YouTube channel. You can also help us out and help the channel grow by commenting uh, and by hitting the like button, you know, the YouTube algorithm. So that's the announcement. Stay tuned. There's much more to come. Thanks. No room for forgiveness, Glenn, on Al Sharpton. What has he done so terribly yeah. lately? And yes, audience, I know we've been here about six times, but we never know how much of it any one of you has seen. And for those of you who are new to this, Glenn, <laughs> Al Sharpton hasn't done anything reprehensible since roughly 2004, when he tried to call Howard Dean a racist for not having enough black people in his administration in Vermont, where there are negative 17 black people present at all. Anyway, that is the last time I remember being angry with Al Sharpton. And in 2004, I was barely shaking. Uh, Crown Heights. That, that was long Okay, before. that was a long time. Of Twata Brawley, we won't even bother well, to mention. That was horrible. But uh, that thing that happened up on 125th Street where people died. Oh, with Freddy's. All of that is... Because we can't have white people, especially yeah. Jews, running into shops in the, in the hood. That was 1980. He was in a tracksuit. Is there no room for forgiveness? He hasn't done anything like that for a long time. Don't well, you? I could go ahead and comment him on you and try to find out why you're so <laughs> interested in rehabilitating this anti-Semitic anti Because I don't like just, hating people unless they deserve it. I didn't hate anybody. I just described them as an anti-Semitic <laughs> ambulance <laughs> chasing the flu. You hate on him. <laughs> Chase any ambulances. I don't know how he really feels about Jewish people. He probably doesn't have any feelings at all. He was a huckster. Yeah, he was a disgusting okay. That's quite possible. buffoon then. But you are on him. When for 20 years he's been an ominously thin, relatively uninteresting host of a low-rated show on MSNBC. What's he and a host of others, Benjamin Crump could come in here for mention, are, milk, the are milking show. these fraught circumstances that are right here, trigger on the edge of violence and chaos for all it's worth running around giving speeches and inciting a sentiment amongst African Americans, which is disconnected from reality and um, unrelated to what it is that actually needs to be done in order to advance the conditions of our people. And, and they're, they are performing uh, an act. And I despise the act, John, and therefore I fear some of that uh, right. contempt and some of that, what you're calling hatred, spills over to the personalities involved. I, I think they're mischievous. I think they're bad people in terms of the public life of the country. I think the race card that they're playing is rotten. It's rotten to the core. It's a lie. Crump deserves this. Sharpton deserved this in the era of Atari and when McDonald's food <laughs> came in styrofoam. <laughs> I, I know what okay, you I'm mean. older than you, John. It's true. <laughs> it's just, true. Well, no, I'm just saying that you, you are still angry at him. I'm old enough to remember that stuff he did on television. Yeah, remember okay, there's, okay. What, there's a thing called a television? That's what he did. <laughs> but he hasn't done it lately. And I guess there was a time he and I have spoken. I'm, notice I'm about to say it two times. I'm a, becoming one of those people who inflates... His memories. It wasn't two times. It was one time. I had one long talk with with in Reverend a green room Al because he he wanted me to come in and talk to him. And yes, I was flattered just because he's a celebrity. And when he was talking about these boys, we talked about this sort of thing. And I I asked him some slightly probing questions. He would have to be a damn good actor. And then let's face it, I guess in his case he is kind of an actor. He would have to be a damn good actor to have been insincere when he talked about his true interest in helping these families cares. to cope with the death. He was talking about how none of them have fathers and that he goes to effort to collect money for these people. And I thought he really, he cares. He certainly wasn't acting like he cared about anything up, up in Harlem back in 1989 or whenever that happened. But he's, he changes. This you is know? the guy uh, who had George Floyd's funeral where he preached a sermon. Yeah. Uh, use the metaphor of America having its knee on the neck of black people. He did say that. My question for you, John, is do you think that that's an accurate no. description of the condition of 
uh, black people in this country. No, I do not. Do, what, what good comes of that kind of demagoguery? But he really is, it is demagoguery, isn't it? No, he really believes that these things are all about race because he has no reason to study the numbers the way you and I have tried to. And even if he hears somebody like us describe them, he thinks that there's a larger truth. And in our era, just like with Obama and the Trayvon comment, those larger truths can be so powerful that there has to be a little something wrong with you to speak out publicly against them. And that's true of you and me, frankly. There's something a little wrong with us. We're odd. Whereas he does think that that George Floyd was killed because he was black. He couldn't hear anything else. That doesn't make him a bad person. I have seen white people who I've tried to get this across to who look at me with this blank look. I remember the, the last person I had just like... They and you can tell it. what they're thinking is, one, he's right, but two, <laughs> it's, and a little bit of it is, what's wrong with him? He's not a good black person. And then a third part of it is, am I being one of those white people who doesn't want to listen to the truth? And then fourth, they go back to themselves. You can see it. If I were an actor, I could give you all the stages. And they go back. And you can just tell this is a fact that they can't accept. Just like if you are a person who is religiously devout, Somebody could sit and give this elegant proof that there's no God, and you just think, yeah, that's that's interesting, and then you, you move on. That's what this black-white cop thing is. I sympathize with Sharpton in not being able to admit that. Almost no one can. That doesn't make them bad people. You really think it makes them bad people to not be able to open themselves up to that? It, you know, I, I don't know about the inner thinking of these people. Me either, but I like to their surmise. You know conscience and all of that. Uh, what I do know is that there are black leaders who are engaged in the kind of constructive developmental work, uh, educating kids, helping ex-offenders, mm -hmm. dealing with people who are uh, struggling with their housing situation and whatnot, uh, who are homeless and so forth. Um, working in communities around this country, some of them are ministers of the gospel of one stripe or another. Some of them are secular people like uh, the great Robert Woodson of uh, the Woodson Center and so on. And I know that in my uh, considered opinion, that's where the solution to these uh, issues lie. And that's where you're right. we're going to get fewer George Floyds and so forth. That kind of healing and that kind of development and that kind of uh, hands-on and that kind of people-centric uh, constructive work. I think the politics of the Democratic Party is uh, uh, perfect for creating the careers of people like Al Sharpton, who broker the race card and the votes of black Democrats for the access that they can get and who, who play a certain kind of functional role in something that I think really poorly represents the interests of African Americans rightly understood. If Al Sharpton were running around talking about charter schools, if he were running around urging African Americans to adopt kids who don't have any parents, if he were insisting that it's possible for black kids to compete effectively if they get the kind of instruction and support that they need to acquire uh, the intellectual skills that allow them to compete in the exam school situation or anything like that. If he was going to find ex-offenders who were prepared to reject the gang life and affirm decent ways of living and uh, foster uh, relationships of guidance with young men who are not yet on the right path and so forth and so on. If he was working with the cops and not against the cops to try to keep the peace in some of these neighborhoods, um, I'd have more respect for him. But it's a very high level shtick. He's refined it uh, to perfection. And he's out Jesse Jacksoning Jesse Jackson in the 21st century while the clock keeps ticking on poor black people. And uh, the demagoguery that spews out of him is almost completely unrelated to the actual material needs of his population. Joe Biden is going to rescue uh, inner city Baltimore? Really? At the brokerage of Al Sharpton? Joe Biden is going to save uh, uh, education for poor black people? Joe Biden is going to make it safe to walk on the south side of Chicago after midnight? Because Al Sharpton is in the Oval Office? No. This is what the problem is. Al Sharpton knows a lot of those things, but there's one thing that can happen. 
you've got one of those inner city ministers, one of those inner city ex-cons who helps a couple of kids stay on the straight and narrow and, and they get on the straight and narrow and they have a couple of kids themselves and they get gray hair and they're running a store. And you know what? No one's going to make a movie about that and nobody is going to put that on the news, although that's where it needs to go. If Al Sharpton says one colorful thing about George Floyd that's in the news for a week, that gets this huge audience response, it's more viscerally stimulating. The idea that to be black is to run, run around always afraid that a cop is going to come jump you to the ground. That is a fun cowboys and Indian story. It also appeals to the probably one in three people who find the victim complex attractive. Whereas what needs to be done for the black community doesn't lend itself to that kind of drama. And so it doesn't get as much attention. And so, yeah, Sh you're calling Sharpton having shtick. Yeah, he's got some lines that he uses because it gets a rise out of an audience. Yeah, I can see how he would do that. It's not that he doesn't do anything else, but you're not going to hear about it. I have sat at a forum in Harlem. I forget why I was there. Because I was giving a little talk. It was a, it was a, it was a school. It was an after-school program for disadvantaged kids, and I was there at the end-of-the-year ceremony. One of the guests was Anthony Appiah for some reason. The other guest was Al Sharpton. And he's up there on stage. <laughs> and he was talking about school and tutoring and how he was in favor of charter schools, etc. But no one ever heard about that. And there were no cameras because that wasn't an exciting evening as opposed to him speaking at George Floyd's funeral. That's and quite, that's the problem. If I may, I mean, that's quite an unusual assemblage. You... Uh, Sharpton and Anthony Appy, who people may need not know, is a professor yes. of philosophy, a very distinguished scholar. British um, and uh, Ghanaian. Ghanaian by yeah. birth and uh, British and American by education and former professor at Harvard and at Princeton now, if I'm not mistaken. He's at Princeton, right. But very erudite, uh, you know, writes books that almost nobody can understand. You know who so. organized this? Well, um, Lenora Fulani who we have never talked about. And she runs, or ran, I've kind of lost touch with her, but ran this after-school program. And she and I, I hung out a little bit for a couple of years. And so that's what this was. And I was there, and I wasn't there as, to put it carefully, more people probably know who I am now than, than then. It was Apia and Sharpton, and I honestly forget what my part of it was. I remember I was wearing a blazer, so I must have gotten up and said something to somebody. But it was about them. And they both gave interesting talks. But Sharpton was perfectly sane. But there's no drama in that. That wouldn't make it into the movie. But th this is a problem. Because the real work is undramatic. What do you do about that? I don't know if there's an answer. 